I want to ask you another question about growth hormone. It's a it's a hormone that that I've prescribed to patients when they're healing from injuries. So I've seen pretty good literature um, that says you know you're having you know you tear a bicep, you have surgery to repair it. Growth hormone for eight weeks fosters rehabilitation uh, better than if you did nothing. So. So that's the very narrow window in which I've prescribed growth hormone is typically around the healing from orthopedic injuries. A couple of things I'll say. Um, every patient I've prescribed it to, and there hasn't been many, maybe half a dozen over the last 10 years, they all say, I've never felt better. Which then helps me understand why this cottage industry of doctors out there exists who run longevity clinics prescribing growth hormone. Um, I've drawn a hard line in the sand with my patients that I don't believe in the literature that would suggest that prescribing growth hormone is a pro-longevity tool. But if I'm being brutally honest, and I tell them this as well, I can't tell you that it's killing you either, right? Like I, I, I can come up with theoretical arguments why prescribing growth hormone is going to make you feel better, but is going to shorten your life. But I don't really see any data one way or the other. And even when you look at extreme cases, which are basically athletes who use, you know, growth hormone is the most abused drug in all of sports because we don't have a test for it. Um, you'd think that the, the, mortu the, the morgue of athletes would be much bigger. So I, what, what is your view on exogenous growth hormone uh, as, as, a, as a, not necessarily a pro-longevity tool, but as an agent that clearly helps health span, but might be not as destructive to lifespan as I believe it could be? I think you're absolutely right. Look, we're talking about chronic, you know, chronic environment, okay? And that has nothing to do with the fact that there could be indication for growth hormone. You mentioned one. Uh, there is a paper about growth hormone after strokes. Okay, mm. We were actually interested in growth hormone in the brain. Uh, there are more examples like that. So I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Right. And, and, and I've, often, I've often wondered, by the way, I haven't seen the literature. If you know of it, I'd love to see it. Would growth hormone be protective in stages of early cognitive decline? Um, but anyway, let, putting that aside for a moment, what about this idea of the 50-year-old who goes to the longevity clinic and they're being given low doses of growth hormone every single day? Typically, it's somewhere between 0.4 and 1 milligram daily. I'm not going to answer you about the dose, but I'm, I'm going to make the, the thing that I think is very important, and it's getting us back to this antagonistic pleiotrophy, and it's relevant to tame and metformin. It is possible that things that you're doing are good for you when you're young and mm. against you when you're old, right? So when people are asking me on any of those uh, geroprotectors, gerotherapeutics, vitamins, um, what, what, when do we start them? Okay, the answer is, I really, I really don't know. I think, I think you shouldn't get senolytics before you're 70 or 80 years old. I think probably metformin, although we start the study at 65, most of the studies so far that showed really large effect of metformin are people who were recruited above the age of 50. So I think it's 50. So I, I don't know to tell you for a singular patient who chronologically, chronological age is 50 and biological age, I don't know what it is. You can determine it better. Well, what do I tell them? I don't, I don't really know based on literature, based on clinical trial. So last question on this, Nir, based on the number of people that are taking growth hormone out there, and I, I don't know how you would quantify this, but uh, um, presumably it's not rocket science to figure it out, but let's just say that there are hundreds of thousands of people in the United States alone who are taking growth hormone daily as part of a geroprotective regimen. Um, why aren't they all dying prematurely? 
We don't know that. Assuming that they're older. Well, yeah, well but, but we don't know we, that. We, well, that's true. We don't know it. But wouldn't we see a signal of it? I think not, because the people who are taking growth hormone are probably taking also metformin and exercising and doing other things. Yeah. So fair, fair point. There's too many confounders. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, again, I, my view is still and probably will remain for the foreseeable future that it is not a great geroprotective agent um, because I do have these concerns. But I re this is an example of something where I really wish we had data. I want to tell you another thing that also is, is a gray zone for me. Most of the negative effect of growth hormone IGF in humans, we see in females, not in males. A actually, mm. in, in animals too. In animals too. So I'll, I'll describe two things. Um, when we look at our centenarians, that, that's done by Sophia Milman, who's running the longevity studies now. And she measured IGF-1 in, in all our, our, our patients. And she looked at our centenarian uh, and our centenarian. So they're already 100 years old, okay? Yep. <laughs> um, is IGF-1 level predicts their longevity. And remember, centenarians are likely to die, 30% of them are going to die each year. <laughs> so, uh, so those with the lowest half of IGF-1 lived twice as long as those with the highest level of IGF-1. And that's females only or both sexes? That's females only. Okay. Males, we don't have, you know, the ratio of female-male centenarians around the world is there are 85 females for every 15 men. We have better results because most, a lot of the female centenarians have never got married, you know, nuns and other things, going back to your problem with your kids, right? <laughs> uh, but we need people with offspring. Our study is based on, on, yeah. on offspring because the phenotype, the phenotype you capture in offspring and not in yeah. centenarians. In centenarians, the phenotype is going down already. Okay, those women also have better cognitive function and as far as muscle function, it's not different. In other words, they are not paying, I think a lot of our problem when we come from sports, right? We're trying to preserve muscle. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sure that low IGF is the best way to preserve muscle. I think maybe it's making the muscle uh, biology better, but it's not making the muscle any better. Sorry, just to be clear, you're saying that the women in the bottom uh, quartile, say, of IGF are no more likely to be sarcopenic than the women with higher IGF, but they do tend to live longer. And smarter and cognitively They have better, better cognitive function. Right. Yeah. With and male, it's not, there is a trend, but it's not significant. So I think that if you have male, you know, and, and that's my way out of that. If you, it's a lot of it is males that are taking it. I haven't convinced myself in my study that it's not a major sex differences, the sensitivity mm -hmm. to growth hormone. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just reflecting on the few patients in my practice who do take growth hormone. It is prescribed by other doctors. I've made it clear that I'm not thrilled about it, but they feel strongly about it and it's their choice. I think it's an equal, it's a very small number. It's an equal mix of male and female. Mm -hmm. Which again, gets to a question that we are going to talk about today, which is health span, lifespan trade-offs. So uh, let's continue down this path of double clicking on the centenarians and their bucket three genes. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.